How are we all doing? Good? So look, I know what you're thinking. Here comes a word from the sponsor. Uh, the good news is I've got 65 slides of features and functions of Salesforce. I thought we'd work through this morning. Um, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Uh, but you probably are thinking, what does Salesforce have to do with the topic at hand? Well, there's really three reasons why we're here. Uh, one is uh, we are the uh, pioneer and leading evangelist around what today is called cloud computing. Uh, second of all, we've been recognised by Forbes as the most innovative company in the world for the last five consecutive years. And third of all, our public sector business right here in this country is growing at a phenomenal rate. And in New South Wales State, as an example, we're working with agencies such as Family and Community Services, uh, uh, Service New South Wales, as well as Transport for New South Wales, who are driving unprecedented levels of innovation on our platform. So uh, what I thought we could do this morning is talk a little bit about what's going on in the industry, what are some of the forces that's shaping uh, the world of AI and smart machines, and then really reflect on then what's the opportunity for government to really rethink the customer experience. Now I have to show you this slide, uh, I'm not expecting you to read it all, but the reason this slide is here is because what I'm going to be talking to you about today is completely futures. Uh, a lot of the technologies I'm going to be sharing with you today are things that the industry is working on, it's things that we are working on, but it is not generally available today in the market. If you do want to talk about any of that stuff, I've got a team of colleagues down the front and they can talk to you about stuff that we have in the market today, but everything that we're talking about uh, is directional. So let's start with where are we from an industry perspective. I think if you've been around for the last uh, three or four decades, you'll agree with me that we've seen phenomenal disruption in the tech industry. Started with the mainframe era, client server, web 1.0 and then web 2.0, uh, particularly with cloud, social, mobility, etc. And what's fascinating when you look at this sequence of activity, uh, all the way from mainframe through to IoT and smart machines, is the overall cumulative capability that has been layered upon layer at each step of the, uh, the disruption is significant. And if you look at where we're at today, we've got a level of capability and sophistication that we've never had before in the industry. And that's why there's so much excitement around digital government and innovation, et cetera. Uh, when you think about AI, though, this, this chart's actually slightly incorrect. We talk here about officially starting in 2010. If you go back to some of the uh, work that was done in like, places like Stanford Research Labs and others, AI's actually been around since the late 60s, early 70s. It's probably only since about 2010 that we've had the processing power to actually make a material difference around AI, which is kind of why we're starting here. But if you look at where we're at from an AI perspective, I'd suggest to you we're right at the very beginning of AI. And whilst it does hold a lot of promise, not for just for public sector but also private enterprise, uh, it is at its early, early infancy. So just bear that in mind as we go through today. Now the other thing that you're probably thinking is uh, the, the sort of the, the paranoia around AI. And the good news is that a lot of that paranoia is quite simply science fiction. Uh, the Terminator is not coming back to Earth to, to be able to take control. HAL 9000 is not going to guide us uh, uh, through space. That is largely still the result of science fiction. Uh, the reason for that is that actually to build a computer or a set of machinery that mimics humans and specifically the human brain is incredibly challenging and we are still at the very infancy. In 2013, the Obama government dedicated a billion dollars and a 30-year program to be able to map uh, and analyse the human brain so that it could be used for AI purposes. The first 10 years of that program is only dedicated towards mapping fruit flies and mouse or mice. And I think the only uh, relevance of that in terms of mouse brains is for the current president of the United States as opposed to anyone else. The reality is, though, it's going to take us a long time to get to this level of, of promise. So you, everyone can just relax, take a deep breath. Big AI is, is not really a threat. Uh, what we do talk about, though, it's, uh, a lot is around what we would call little AI. So what's little AI? Little AI is small embedded piece of intelligence that takes the friction out of everyday processes. Small, little pieces of intelligence that take the friction out of uh, everyday processes. That's what we think we're dealing with today and that's what we think we're going to be dealing with for some time. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by little AI. Most of you would have seen this if you're, if you're a book junkie like I am. 
Uh, Amazon has me down pat. Uh, every time I buy a book, it's recommending another book. It's not just basing it based on the topic I've read, but it's also basing it based on what it knows about me and what it talks about with customers that are similar to me. But the other thing that Amazon's done in terms of this idea of removing friction is they came up with this concept now, which is incredibly dangerous, which they call one click. One click basically means that at the click of a button, I can go ahead and I can buy that book based on the recommendation. So what's actually happening behind the scenes here? Well, what Amazon's doing, it's authenticating who I am. It knows that my delivery address is valid. It knows I've got a balance on my credit card. And literally, at the click of that button, all of those back-end processes are automated, and the book is dispatched. That's what I mean by little AI. It's removing the friction out of the everyday process. Uh, another example that I'll share with you, this one happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I took my kids to see the very educational movie called Boss Baby. Has anyone ever seen that? That's a fascinating movie. But what happened with this one is I actually went online uh, on my laptop and I bought some tickets to the 3 o'clock session at a cinema in Bondi Junction, New South Wales. And at about 20 past 2, my Apple Watch started vibrating and it actually sent me a message and said, Dan, the traffic from your home to the cinema is unusually high. You need to leave now. And I remember looking at that and thinking, how, how did it work that out? I didn't set up anything. I didn't configure anything. That's little AI. What happened behind the scenes is that the machine went into my email inbox, worked out that I'd got an invoice from the cinema company. I had a 3 o'clock booking at the particular cinema. Worked out based on my Apple Watch where I was located. Went onto Google Maps and worked out what the route was and what the traffic is. And then sends me a notification says, to say, Dan, you've got to get in the car. You've got to go now. That's little AI. And we're going to see a lot more of that uh, over the next several years. So apart from little AI, what else are we going to see? Well, uh, what we're going to see is really uh, as a result of five key things. Uh, the first is, is really around mobility. Uh, we talked already about the, just the volume of handsets around the world. Connectivity, not just in terms of connecting individuals, but increasingly connecting machines. Uh, analysts are telling us we're going to have about 75 billion connected devices by about 2020. Uh, the speed and velocity of change is going to be a massive uh, uh, impact. Uh, intelligence, particularly uh, AI and machine learning. And then finally, uh, productivity. Uh, what I would say to you, though, in terms of um, uh, the future is this device is going to continue for some time. This is the personal computer that Steve Jobs wanted in everyone's pocket. This is it. And we see this as continuing in its relevancy over the next decade. Uh, what we will see over the next several years is the uh, processing power we think is going to increase by about a factor of three and the storage capacity will increase by about a factor of five, but this will be the primary uh, device by which we engage with the rest of the world. And then increasingly, if I can get the slides working, what's going to happen is we're going to connect to the world around us through this device. So a great example is Fitbit. How many people wear a Fitbit or some sort of similar device? Okay, a bunch of us. So the value of Fitbit is not just in terms of changing our behavior, but it's in the diagnostic information that's captured. And GPs and insurers, uh, some of our customers in Asia Pacific, are already leveraging Fitbits to be able to better understand their customers and better price their insurance premiums based on level of activity and general health, how much sleep they're getting, et cetera. Uh, the device at the top of the screen is a little device called uh, Automatic. Uh, you can plug it into the underneath of your car, and it's like a Fitbit for your car. It'll tell you how far you've gone, how often you've traveled, what the health of the brakes is, when you next need a service, and you can access all of that on your smartphone. Uh, and then down the bottom, you've got a device like uh, uh, Google Nest, which is uh, the smart thermostat, but that's really a proxy for what we see as being the connected home. And the idea here is all of that data uh, is interesting to companies that provide us services, and all of that is controlled uh, through that handset that we mentioned earlier. But there's some other interesting things that is coming down the wire. Should I be pointing this at anything in particular? No? We're OK? Um, the first is uh, augmented reality. So let me distinguish between virtual reality. Virtual reality is when you strap on that uh, really attractive headset and experience the world around you. Augmented reality is enhancing the reality that we see or augmenting it. 
Uh, the first version of this you saw, do you remember all those strange people that walked around with that really funky eyewear, sort of winking and, and trying to get things working? That was a Google Glass. Google's about to release version two of that device uh, uh, shortly, and that is, that is uh, supposed to be able to deliver a significant innovation in uh, providing augmented reality. Most of you, if you've got kids like I do, uh, had kids that embraced augmented reality late last year with a Pokemon phenomena. Uh, literally, it was the only thing that I could use to get my kids off the couch and outside and exercising. And what was amazing is the way in which they viewed the world in order to engage with that particular game was through the phone. And the, you could only catch the Pokemon through the augmented reality experience. We think augmented reality is going to be significantly big. And again, we're just at the tipping point of, of what that is. Uh, the second thing that we think is going to be very uh, important is haptic or tactile reality. Uh, haptic actually comes from the Greek word, which is to touch. Uh, and uh, there's a gentleman by the name of uh, David uh, Eagleman, uh, who's the gentleman on this slide. He gave a really fascinating uh, TED talk, if you get a chance to, uh, to take a look at it. And what David's doing is he's pioneering some research where he can turn sound waves into vibratory uh, sensors. And so that vest that he's wearing is actually converting sound into sensations which he can now feel on his body. And the idea being if you're um, blind, as an example, those sound sensors are going to translate into something that vibrates and now be able to provide instructions. And based on the current prototypes that David has, within about two to three months of training, this device is incredibly useful for a, a deaf or a blind person to be able to actually navigate the world around them just through uh, sensors. Uh, this gentleman here on this slide uh, is uh, pioneering uh, research. Uh, his name is Hugh Herr. Uh, he's head of uh, biomechanics at Stanford Research Lab, uh, sorry, at MIT. And what um, Hugh is actually uh, pioneering is uh, brain control. Unfortunately for Hugh, he had both his legs uh, amputated um, several decades ago. But what he's wearing at the moment are a set of artificial legs that are wired into his central nervous system. And just by using his thought process, he's able to control the way his legs move. Uh, you may also see in the picture behind him, he's got a range of different legs he uses for different occasions, whether he's climbing hills or whether he's in the office or what have you. But leaving that aside, the idea that you can now control a machine simply through thought is absolutely incredible. And uh, we, should, we should all keep an eye on this. We think that uh, this is going to be very significant as we start interacting with the world around us. So the question then you're probably asking yourself is, OK, well, so what? Uh, what's the impact on the customer experience? Well, let me share with you uh, what our view is on that. So here's an interesting statistic that comes from our friends at Gartner. Uh, what Gartner view is that by 2018, 30% uh, of all interactions uh, with technology will actually be through conversations with smart machines. And here you should think of smart machines as not just the physical machine, but things like chatbots, artificial intelligence. So 30% will be through these devices. Uh, some research that we looked at uh, early this year was quite uh, eye-opening to us in terms of trends. Sorry about that. Uh, the first is, 51% um, of customers uh, that came out of this survey actually uh, want to have 24 by 7 access to the brands and the agencies that they engage with. And therefore, digital service and increasingly artificial intelligence-led service is massively important for them. They want 24 by 7 access. They don't like the idea of it closing at a certain time. But then if you have a look at the other two statistics, 46% of people prefer to use a messaging platform like Facebook Messenger as opposed to emailing. And 49% would actually prefer to use a messaging platform rather than pick up the phone and call a human being. So we think if you, if you sort of fast forward, that messaging is going to be massive. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But increasingly, bots and chatbots to replace the human interaction is going to make a massive impact on the customer experience. So let me give you some examples about that. Um, I love this quote, actually. I found this uh, as I was preparing for today's session. Um, I thought it really summarized what the essence of, of what we're dealing with is. The future of the customer service is making it easy for consumers to go through the medium they want 
have an experience that respects their time and have their issues resolved quickly and ideally without involving a human being at all. I really thought that was profound. I think that is actually the future of customer service. And I think the challenge for many of us, be us in the private enterprise or public enterprise, is how do we deliver on that? Now, there are a couple of subtleties in that. The first is, uh, if you go through kind of the whole multi-channel service paradigm, the idea was if you're an agency, you published a set of channels. We have a call center, we have a website, we might have a store. If you want to contact us, you come through one of those channels. And I think the shift that this quote is, is, uh, is hinting at is actually we have to go to where the customers are. And if they happen to be in Messenger, or they happen to be using SMS, or they happen to be somewhere, that's where the service experience not, needs to take place, as opposed to directing them to, into a channel that's convenient for us. And the second implication of this is uh, the fact that it's, although it's a human-like experience, it's actually not delivered through human intervention. It's actually increasingly delivered by artificial intelligence and machines. So let me talk about uh, two innovations that we're driving uh, at the moment. The first in relation to SMS technology and the second in relation to uh, messaging. Uh, up until now, if you think about SMS technology, it's really, uh, from a business or government perspective, only been used from a one-way communication. I.e., if I, as the agency, wanted to communicate with customers en masse, I sent them a message. And it was often uh, ended with, please do not reply to this text. Right? The change that we're driving here is to actually have SMS as two-way communication. So if a customer wants to send the agency an SMS with an inquiry, they can do that and it gets routed into the call center uh, or service center that deals with it. What's increasingly happening though is the, uh, what's actually uh, corresponding with the c customer is actually not the human being in the call center, it's actually an artificial intelligence based bot that is mimicking the characteristics of a human being. And I'll give you some examples of that. The second thing that we're driving is actually this idea of uh, messaging. Uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, uh, which was announced uh, as a communication platform but also as a commerce platform at their conference a couple of years ago, uh, we believe is just at the early infancy. But what's happening, particularly in the United States today, is that brands are allowing their customers not just to contact them with an inquiry, but to undertake an entire commerce-based transaction through Messenger. And it harps back to what I shared with you earlier, which is rather than say to the customer, leave Facebook and come to our digital platform, we actually want them to do the service inquiry or the commerce transaction in the platform that they happen to be in. So, uh, sorry, just going back, uh, and then from a business case perspective, if I can go back, uh, what, it, what it suggests to us is we could have anywhere between a 20 to 50% saving of cost just by simply taking the human being out of that interaction. So let me give you an example. Now this is a private sector example, uh, but I think it'll, it'll highlight to you uh, where, this, uh, where the future is going. So this is actually an example of a, uh, some work we're doing with Adidas. Um, this is in the context of an app that Adidas provides to its customers. Uh, but the same technology can be exposed through the APIs to a messaging platform like Facebook Messenger. So think about it in that context. So this is a customer that goes onto the, the uh, Adidas app. Oh, we're going to struggle with this. And straight away we get a greeting from the machine. This is actually an artificial intelligence chatbot. Hi Katie, I'm Addy, I'm your personal uh, support bot. Select an option below or type in your question. Now, the select your option below is pretty standard. That's not really artificial intelligence, but it's just like an IVR system is doing, providing some options to be able to uh, navigate through this platform. Uh, artificial intelligence is this piece down the middle, which is if the customer actually types something into it, having the machine recognize what's that customer's intent, and then being able to do something with the query. But you'll see if I fast forward through this story, if we select customer service as an example, So we just recognize we're seeing customer service. You may have to help me with this clicker, if that's OK. Um, great, I can help you with that. Here are some options you can choose. What do you want to do? Do you want to check your order status, or do you want to return a product? Let's assume they want to return a product. 
what the machine's going to do is then go back through the previous interactions and say, um, which product do you want to return? Here are the products which you bought from Adidas recently. And we can now go and select one of those products. And so we want to uh, return that particular pair of shoes. Uh, just confirm that's what it is. Uh, great, I've already got your details on file. I know your credit number. Um, once you return the goods to us, I'll just go ahead and process that. No human intervention, entirely driven by a chatbot. Uh, would you mind just fast forwarding the screen to me until uh, we get out of this section? So the story continues, but you can see here the idea is really that the machine and the artificial intelligence is driving the human interaction. The customer may not even realize that they are interacting with the machine because that experience was actually personalized. We actually knew who they were, we knew their past transaction, and we spoke to them in human language. Uh, but it's a really fascinating way of thinking about customer experience. Uh, we also are, are leveraging AI from a number of other perspectives. Uh, one is around case resolution. If we know that solutions have been successful in the past in solving cases, what the algorithm can do is it can actually suggest proactively either directly to the consumer or to the agent to say, with problems like this, these are the solutions that we typically uh, advise. And they can match automatically the solution to the problem. The other thing that often gets forgotten about when we talk about AI is uh, image recognition. And one of the big in investments we've made as a company is actually in that. So we've been doing some work recently with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola have uh, literally tens of thousands of people uh, that go out into stores every day and their job is to look at the Coca-Cola refrigerators in the store and they do a couple of things. Firstly, they count how many Coke bottles are in the store, uh, not just Coke labels but from the Coke brands. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they want to track are there competitor bottles in the Coke refrigerator and thirdly, they want to know how many have been taken so that they can automatically uh, uh, order some inventory and it's a really manual, time-consuming, costly process. Well, what we've done uh, with Coca-Cola is this image here that you're looking at on the phone. We actually have a camera that's set up in, in a series of stores. And at regular intervals, the camera is simply just taking a photo of the stock that's in the refrigerator. That's being sent to a visualization engine within the artificial intelligence platform. And what's happening here is those questions that I asked you earlier, how many Coke bottles do we have on hand? Are there any competitor products? And how many of which bottles do I need to order? is now done automatically through the artificial intelligence. And I no longer have to go out and dispatch people uh, to stores to be able to, to count and verify and manually process this. Now, if you think about the power of image recognition for some of the casework that we do, uh, it, this is, this, we think this is going to be massive. And again, we're just at the infancy of this. But I challenge you as you think about AI, don't just think about it in terms of language processing. Think of it as well in relation to image processing. So what's, what's the impact? So I, I actually think the impact from an AI perspective really comes in three ways. Firstly, it comes from a customer experience perspective and specifically in making that a greatly enhanced, more positive, more timely experience than ever before. Second of all, I think the agent's life's become a lot simpler. Uh, we're reducing the burden on the agent. We're enhancing and augmenting some of the decisions the agent needs to make themselves through uh, the AI process. And in some cases, we're actually taking away the burden. And then finally, uh, largely as a result of the first one, the customer life cycle, particularly in terms of loyalty and, and reduced attrition, uh, is impacted. And so if you're thinking about what the business case is, on the left-hand side, you can see some of the metrics. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of those uh, major categories that, uh, that I touched on. So why are we all talking about this? Well, I know that Silicon Valley may not be the, the right proxy, but have a look at this slide. This slide startled me. This is just a sample of all of the artificial intelligence companies at the moment in the industry across a range of different industries and a range of different areas. Some of these are at different levels of funding than others. The message that I wanted to share with you is the rate of innovation that's going on right now from an AI perspective is massive. We've never seen it. And yes, while we had a couple of engineers in, the, uh, in a dark room at Stanford Labs uh, in the past, this is now 
an emerging industry, and in the next uh, uh, several decades, we're going to see the fruits of, of all of this labour. Uh, from a Salesforce perspective, what we've done is we've acquired in the last year uh, about 12 different AI co companies around the world. And we've really done that for two reasons. One, to get our hands on the technology because there's actually some pretty cool AI technology that we've inherited. But more than that, it's actually to get the people. Because the reality is data scientists are at really short supply today. It, it, it's, you, it, there's not like an army of data scientists you can just go and recruit from. Uh, one of the acquisitions we did, a company by the name of Metamine, we actually acquired, apart from the company, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Richard Socha, uh, who's the head of uh, the analytics uh, arm of Stanford uh, University, uh, one of the pioneers around artificial intelligence. He is now our chief data scientist and driving a lot of the innovations that we have. Uh, the reason for the cute little icon on the left-hand side of the screen is we call our artificial intelligence platform uh, Einstein. Uh, and Einstein is there to be able to augment the customer experience and the agent experience by providing little AI around each aspect of the customer lifecycle. So you might be sitting here thinking, okay, well, I've given you some good news. The good news is that the, the robots aren't taking over the world. But you might be sitting here and thinking, well, hang on, what does this mean for employment? Does this mean that jobs are going to go away? So let me, let me let me tackle that in the, in the three minutes I have left. So here's an interesting quote I came across. This is talking about, uh, from Time magazine, their perspective on the impact of automation on the jobs. Uh, automation may prevent the economy from creating enough new jobs. Automation is beginning to move in and eliminate service and office jobs too. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Eliminate office jobs. Uh, unfortunately, this article came out in 1961. That's how long this has been going on. The reality is, and this is the good news, the reality is, if you look at, this is the uh, uh, US uh, employment rate uh, from the Bureau of um, Statistics. If you look at, from 1950 to 2015, despite the industrial wave of innovation and then the technology mobile internet wave of innovation, employment in the United States has actually been going at a steady increase. So even though we've had significant advances in those technology revolutions, it actually has not had a net reduction in jobs at all. And our view is that the past actually is a pretty good predictor for the future. Our view is that we won't actually see a net reduction in jobs. What we're going to see is jobs transfer into different areas, and we're going to see entirely new professions uh, and jobs created that we can't even think of today. And we think that's really exciting. So the good news is not a net reduction. We actually think an overall in increase, but a uh, redeployment. So this is some research that from McKinsey, which kind of backs up what I'm telling you. So McKinsey's view is that there are about 60% of occupation where about 30% of the activities in that occupation can be automated. So 60% of jobs have 30% of their activities that can be automated. That does say then that in those 60% of jobs, there's 70% of what they do that can't be automated, so that's good. The other thing that McKinsey says is there are only less than 5% of occupations where 100% of that occupation's jobs can be entirely automated, less than 5%. So although we, we sort of posture this negativity around that you know, AI and machines are taking over the world, we actually, like McKinsey and like uh, some of the other research, don't actually feel that way. So if you dig a little bit deeper, uh, and we turn to McKinsey and say, well, what does this really mean? Well, the middle bar is actually the, the types of activity in various occupations. Management, expertise, interfacing with customers, whether we're working in an unpredictable physical environment, so an environment that constantly changes. Are we collecting data? Are we processing data? Uh, or are we working in a, a, phys a repeatable physical environment? And McKinsey's view is it's only those professions that are entirely focused on collecting data, processing data, or working in a repeatable physical environment, i.e. a conveyor chain or conveyor belt, that are at risk of automation. And even in that case, it's going to be less than 30% of the job. So what it means is if you're a manager, if you have expertise, if you interface with clients, and you're in an unpredictable physical environment, McKinsey's view is we don't think that there's going to be a major impact on jobs in that environment. 
So what's the lesson in all of this? Well, I think the lesson is, and the lesson for our children is, it's about equipping ourselves with the skills we need to learn and relearn and relearn and relearn. Because the environment is changing at such a fast pace that the one human trait that we can carry forward into the future is the ability to teach ourselves how to learn and constantly reinvent ourselves into the future. So on that positive note, I thank you and I look forward to connecting with you later today.